Yeah. The Bill of Rights is that epic and important. It's your right to say what you want, right to a fair trial, and your right to watch Dance Moms all day. Each and every day, the Bill of Rights affects you and your life. But before we talk about the Bill of Rights, it's important to mention how it came to be. For that, we have to look back at the, the Constitutional, Constitutional Convention. 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 The Constitutional Convention started May 1787 in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, where 55 men from 12 states came together to establish our government, define our rights, and essentially run our country. No big deal. Lots of big names were there. James Madison, James Monroe, and Alexander Hamilton just to name a few. But there were also some big names that didn't attend. Thomas Jefferson was in France at the time. John Adams was also abroad, serving as a minister to Great Britain. Even some of our favorite little rebel rousers like Samuel Adams, John Hancock, and Patrick Henry didn't attend because they smelt a rat in Philadelphia, tending towards a monarchy. Their sentiments bring us to how the Bill of Rights came to be. Several men and states believe that the Constitution didn't address the specific rights of the people and therefore refused to ratify it. So, James Madison, known as the father of the Constitution, wrote out amendments that would address these rights. Twelve amendments, to be precise. Eventually, ten of them would be ratified, and those ten are what we call the Bill of Rights. Okay, now that you're up to speed, time for the fun stuff. I like to break the Bill of Rights into three parts. Personal rights, legal rights, and just in case we forgot anything and want to cover our basis rights. I know that sounds long, but trust me, it'll make sense when we get there. Let's start with the First Amendment. This amendment addresses the different ways you can express your feelings. You have the right to practice any religion you'd like, say whatever you like, publish anything you like, provided that it's true, the right to assemble peacefully, and the right to petition the government if they've done something you don't like. This was put in place to give people specific rights to express things about the government they didn't like in a way that ensures that the government cannot inhibit their thoughts in any way. Now, over the course of history, there have been several times where people have used these rights through peaceful protests, political cartoons, and public speeches. Now, it's important to note that while this amendment protects you from governmental prosecution, it doesn't protect you from social consequences. Amendment number two is all about personal protection. It's the right to maintain a well-regulated militia for protection and the right to bear arms. No, no, not like that. This was put into place because at that time, our national military was still pretty weak. Average citizens needed to protect themselves against Native American attacks, potential threats from other country, and if the situation called for it, to rise up against a tyrannical government. To better understand this amendment, we have to look at what these words mean. A well-regulated militia is a group of local men who could act as a military force in times of emergency. They would help fight off Native American raids, invasions, or even act as a local police force. The important identifying factor about these men, though, is that they were expected to be trained, organized, and disciplined. The right to bear arms has been much debated over the years. Some people argue that it protects the right of people to own guns only if they're part of an organized militia, such as the National Guard. Others believe that the Second Amendment protects the right of individuals to own a weapon for their own self-defense. In 2008, the Supreme Court supported this view. The court held that the Second Amendment protects an individual's right to own a gun for personal use, including self-defense inside the home. The Third Amendment deals with soldiers and your home. This amendment prohibits the housing of soldiers in times of peace. So. Basically, a big in-your-face to Great Britain with that whole quartering act thing. Fourth Amendment deals with your personal property and those who can search through your stuff. It talks about things like unreasonable searches and seizures and probable cause, oh my! That's all some pretty crazy legal mumbo jumbo, so let me give you an example. This is Colonist Joe. He looks like a pretty average American citizen. He supports the Patriots, he likes the color blue, and he does like getting caught in the rain. Now. Joe owns a house. It's a pretty nice house. It's his private property. But there's something illegal in that house. Joe's a hoarder and he has a lot of cats. Problem is, none of the cats are his. He's been stealing them for about two years. Yeah, Joe's a little crazy. Now, those cats are hidden in Joe's house and because of that, police can't just enter his house without his consent. But if this police officer obtained a warrant, the officer can enter his home even if crazy Joe doesn't want him to. Oh, when will you learn, Crazy Joe? Those things are illegal! In the criminal justice system, your rights in court are protected by four separate yet equally important amendments. Amendments that protect your entitlement to a fair trial, to remain silent, and prevent cruel and unusual punishment. These are those amendments. 
While you may have not had to deal with your legal rights, and hopefully won't anytime soon, they're still really important. Let's refer back to our good buddy, Crazy Joe. Turns out, he got arrested. Which brings us to the Fifth Amendment. The Fifth Amendment deals with those who are accused of a crime. You have the right to due process, and you have the right to remain silent and not act as a witness against yourself in a crime. Now, if Crazy Joe ends up going to trial, he's going to need to rely on the Sixth Amendment, which covers your rights in criminal cases. A criminal case is brought by the local, state, or federal government in response to a suspected violation of a law and seek a fine or a jail sentence, or both. The Sixth Amendment covers a lot of your legal rights. You have the right to a speedy trial. You have a right to an unbiased jury of your peers. You have the right to know what charges are being brought against you. And finally, you have the right to a lawyer to represent you in court. And if you can't afford one, the state will provide you one. This is to ensure that you have a fair representation in your trial and that someone really knowledgeable about the law can help you plead your case. Now let's say that Crazy Joe has been found innocent of the crime of stealing all his neighbor's cats. But he may have to go to court for another reason. Joe's neighbors can't sleep at night because of all the cat noises coming from his house. His neighbors want to take him to court to deal with these noise complaints. This would be a civil case. Civil cases are generally brought by private individuals or corporations seeking to collect money or monetary compensation. The Seventh Amendment deals with this type of case. In these type of cases, you are allowed to have a trial with a jury or just a judge. Now, let's pretend instead of Joe being found innocent, he was found guilty. I know, I'm sorry Joe. Once you're found innocent of a crime, you can't be found guilty. Regardless, if he is found guilty and he has to go to jail, he can rest assured knowing that the Eighth Amendment, which deals with treatment of criminals, protect him. The Eighth Amendment prohibits excessively high fines and forbids cruel and unusual punishment. The last two amendments deal with all the stuff the Founding Fathers knew they missed mentioning, but still wanted to protect. The Ninth Amendment deals with all of your natural rights not explicitly listed. Reading the Ninth Amendment seems complicated, but it's actually pretty simple. By doing this, the Founding Fathers don't have to write out all of your rights, including the ones that didn't even exist during that time. The Constitution protects your natural rights to pursue happiness in any way you want. They wanted to leave it up to you to interpret that however you'd like. Last but not least, the Tenth Amendment, which addresses the powers of the states and the people. Any power not given to the states by the Constitution or specifically prohibited by the Constitution are left up to the states. The Constitution gives certain powers to the United States as a country, prohibits individual states from having certain powers, and anything left over, the states get to decide what to do with. The Constitution has been around for a pretty long time, but throughout our history, there have been times when people disagree on how to interpret what the Founding Fathers meant. In cases like this, we rely on the judicial branch of our government to deliver rulings, and even then, sometimes the justices disagree. Some believe that the Bill of Rights should be adaptive and should be interpreted based on the needs of that current society. And others, sometimes referred to as the Four Corner Interpreters, believe that we should only take into account what was written in black and white, and make our judgments based off of that. Now, whether you see the Bill of Rights as a living document, a permanent document, or something in between, we should all agree that it's more than just a document. This little piece of paper has the potential to keep you safe, happy, and free every day. So yeah, the Bill of Rights is pretty important and very epic.